today we are finalizing our marathon series. We have been in since the beginning of the year. This is our ninth and final week of our free destined series. So I want to kick off by reading our series verse one more time. You probably know it by heart right now. In Romans chapter eight, verse 28, it says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the first born among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified for the last 8 weeks we've been unpacking these theological elements that Paul presents in these few verses We began on New Year's Eve where I preached a message, I wish you would, unpacking the invitation that we have given to partner with God's sovereign plan. Week two, I preached the message, it's under control, that God gives us control, but when we're out of control, we get to give control back to God. Week three, we had Adam Mesa come, he preached on calling. Week four, we had Pastor Jake Sweetman come, he preached on inheritance. Week five, I preached a message called favor ain't for everyone because it's for those that love God. Week six, I preached a message for and against election. How many people remember that? Realizing there's so much against us in life. It's good to know that God's for us, amen. Week seven, Pastor Vance preached a message on justification. And last week, my wife, the velvet hammer, delivered a message on decisions, connecting God's sovereignty and our free will. Today for our series finale, I wanna... I want to tackle glorification. But before I give you the sermon title, I want to read one more passage of Scripture. Can you stay standing just for one more moment? I want to read this from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. If you don't have it in your Bible, it's up on the screen. It says, Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of, the, because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But in their minds were hardened for to this day when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their hearts. But when the one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, There is freedom and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I want to, I want to do some teaching on this final week of our free destined series. I want to do some teaching around the glory of God and the subject title for today is getting better by the glory of God. Getting better by the glory of God. Are you ready for the word of God today? Are you sure? Convince your neighbor you're ready for the word of God by giving them a bear hug and tell them, I'm ready, I'm ready, I hope you are. Go for it. Come on, tell four or five people that you're ready for the word of God. Thank you, worship team. Remarkable. Amen. So as I was saying, I was in uh, London this week with the London team. It was spectacular. And not only did I get to spend time planning the church plan and strategizing and talking leadership, assigning roles, meeting some new people, doing some leadership, all the things that go into starting a church. This is our 11th location now. So we've learned some stuff. We've learned some things that you need at the beginning and what you need to do. And, and it's fun to implement the plan and implement the process and see people raised to life and get excited about the fact that God wants to use them in such a mighty way. Not only did we get to do all that fun stuff, but we also got to tack on a dad-daughter trip. Zara came with me, and she came on the ministry trip, and she was vital in connecting people in the church. And 
We also got to tack on a few days. And, and I've been doing this for years with my daughters. I've got three daughters. And uh, we do dates regularly, but, but we always get to take, we go on different cycles where I get to take each one of them on a trip. And it's an extended date. It's an extended date where it's all about them, what they want to do and how we're going to do it. And we get to focus time together. And last week was Zara's turn. And we had an epic adventure, a dad-daughter adventure. And I have to tell you, it was fun. I had more fun than I thought I would. We saw sights. We, we shopped. Uh, we got her hair done by one of London's most famous hairdressers. We shopped some more. We took seven million photos. We ran out of data. And, uh, and then when that was done, we shopped some more. It was a spectacular trip. And, and, and we were in the, the, the shopping district uh, of Paris. And, and admittedly, uh, we were actually window shopping. I didn't have money to spend, but we were in there. And it's just fun, you know what I mean? It's just fun to walk into the designer stores and act like you're a celebrity. And, and they say, hello. And you're like, oh, hi. And uh, you walk in and, and you just... You just start looking at stuff, pulling stuff off the shelves, and they send you two assistants to help you. It's just fun. It's like, you know, you're a king for a day. And, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll in this one particular store, because I really wanted to get my wife a gift. I wanted to get her these pajamas. I wanted to get her, like, some silk pajamas. And so I was looking at these particular pajamas. I saw the price tag. You ever do this where you see the price tag and you pretend like you're still interested, even though, <laughs> even though there ain't no way you're buying those things, right? And so I'm looking, I'm like, oh, great design. Um, I just don't know what size she is. And she literally looks at Zara and says, oh, she's an extra small. I said, oh, this ain't my wife. This is my daughter. And she was so embarrassed. She said, oh, I'm, 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 so, I'm so sorry. I said, no, 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 I'm on a daddy-daughter date. This is a trip. And I was explaining the trip. And she was astounded. She, she said, Man, you you got to be making it difficult for their future husbands. I said, you got it. I said, that's exactly my plan. I'm trying to raise the bar so high, it's almost unattainable. Ain't no young kid going to come on on a half-wage salary and try and date my girls. They ain't going to, it's not going to happen. They are going to be so well dated and so spoiled that they are not going to even blink at some. I'm trying to raise the bar. Which is exactly what grace is, by the way. One of the most severe misunderstandings I think that happens in Christendom is this thought or this misrepresentation of the new covenant grace is that Jesus somehow lowers the bar of righteousness so that we who could not obtain the rigid requirements of the law could somehow make it in. This is unfortunately a complete misunderstanding of grace and couldn't be further from the truth because Jesus didn't lower the bar or lower the standard. If anything, he raised the bar. Can I get teaching straight from the start? You see, in Matthew chapter 5, we find one of Jesus' most famous sermons, Sermon on the Mount, where he presented a new covenant way of thinking. For instance, in one section, he reveals that under the old covenant, thinking uh, murder was liable for judgment. Because under the law of Moses, which is the Ten Commandments, it was widely known that thou shalt not murder. However, Jesus proceeds to tell them in verse 22 that anyone who is even angry is actually liable for judgment. I mean, you think that's tough. To achieve. Only a few verses later in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he says this You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who even looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus didn't lower the bar, he raised the bar. Jesus takes what the standard was to obtain righteousness and he takes it from mainly, merely possible to impossible. He wanted to make sure for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those of the religious law that lived meticulously by the law to the letter of the law who thought they were righteous by their standard, thought because I haven't murdered anybody, I haven't committed adultery, even the thoughts, the anger, the responses disqualified them from righteousness. It wasn't attainable by any standard or any measure. This is what Jesus came to do. He essentially did what I was doing as a dad. He's raising the bar. He's making it impossible. He's wanting people to know as a Sermon on the Mount under New Covenant thinking, 
You thought you could make it on your own. It's impossible. You can't. Jesus lifts it. He lifts the bar. And he raised it. Not only did he raise it, he also then proceeded to fill the gap where we fall short. In fact, maybe I could build a little more on this tension this morning because I think one of the most challenging expectations of a Christian has to be the expectation for Christians to be Christ-like. Like, this is hard. You ever thought about it? Like, like that is tough, and it's not just a suggestion. It's an expectation. Like, that as a follower of Jesus, it wouldn't be just a nice option that maybe, you know, you could get a little more kinder or that you could get a little bit better, but that you would actually resemble Christ on the earth. That we, that's what Christian means, it's little Christ, that you would literally live your life in such a way that when people look at you, they can't tell, is that Jesus or is that Vance? That's what you're meant to live, you're meant to live with that much kindness and that's the goal, it's not even just, the goal It's the expectation, that's pressure. Paul makes this expectation very clear in Romans 8 29 regarding the sovereign plan of God for those that are called of God he says to to those that are called are meant to now be conformed to the image of the son that your walk with Christ would shape you that it would begin to conform you that it would begin to to make you look more like Jesus as a result of walking with Jesus It's exciting, but it's challenging. Because I've got to ask the question, do you look more like Jesus? In a self-assessment, I'm not going to assess it for you. I'm going to let you do the self-assessment today. I'm going to offend you. But if you do a self-assessment, after all this time, do I, do I look more like Jesus? Am I Christ-like? This is meant to be a fun sermon. It's not meant to be heavy, so feel free to laugh and cry at all at the same time. But the truth is, this is a challenge. In other words, the successful Christian life resembles Jesus. If Christ-likeness is the measure marker of Christian success, how many people honestly feel successful? I felt like Jesus this trip. For a moment, I'll be honest with you. There was a moment where I was, in my own opinion, uh, was very Christ-like. There was a situation, I shared this with the Brotherhood, and I thought I would share it with you, a situation when we were in Paris where uh, we, we, we had a whole like, day planned. And uh, I built the itinerary, by the way. That's what you do on a date. Husbands, by the way, you don't get to date night and say, hey, honey, what do you want to do? You, you come to your wife and say, put your nice dress on. <laughs> Not that one, the, the black one. Yeah, put that on. <laughs> we're going out tonight. I got a reservation. That is romance, by the way. Romance isn't spontaneous. Romance is planned. It's free stuff. This isn't even our marriage series. I'm just giving you free stuff today. But anyway, we had an itinerary plan, printed it out, planned all the reservations, locked it all in. And one of the plans was we didn't want to just see the Eiffel Tower in the daytime. We wanted to see it sparkle. We did research and realized that the Eiffel Tower only sparkles on every hour for five minutes. So if you plan your approach, you have to plan the time you get there. And so we planned dinner, and then after dinner, we we're going to walk our way up to the Eiffel Tower, and we had our spot picked out. I looked it on Google Maps beforehand. I didn't want to waste time fighting the crowds. I had a perfect spot picked out directly across from the Eiffel Tower, across the river, where we could get the full scope of it right on the stroke of 8 p.m. We we're ready and poised. We got there 15 minutes early, secured our spot, and we were just chatting it up, just talking about life, talking about the future, talking about fashion, talking about plans, just talking about everything. As we were talking, this young girl, probably about 25 years old, walks up beside me and says, sir, do you speak English? I said, yeah, one of my languages. <laughs> I noticed that she was shaking and crying. She said, can I stand with you? There's a man following me. He's been following me since the tower. I said, sure. You're welcome to stand right here. I proceeded to look around and I saw the creepiest trafficker I've ever seen in my life. Like, you know when, don't read, you know, judge a book by its cover. This guy was, I was judging straight up. Like, he is like straight up from Taken. You know that movie? Like, I'm like, this guy is legit. It's the movie. It's happening right now. And I look back and I 
proceeded to mention to her, is it the guy? And I described the guy. She said, yes, that's him. And my daughter was hearing this whole thing. And so she decided, she is like, she is, I'm sure, I'm convinced, Zara, you're a six on the Enneagram like Kira. Because she starts recording and pretending that she's recording. But she's recording the situation, this dude. I look back, now he's like right up next to us. In fact, let me show you the video that Zara recorded. Would you like to see it? Don't take my word for it. I'll let you be the judge of this trafficker. Can we put this up real quick? Because she, here we are, and we're watching the Eiffel Tower, and Zara's just panning, and this girl's on my right, and you'll see as she pans around, uh, she's just pretending to look at a lamppost, because that's interesting, and just random people, because that's what you want to see. And then there, that's him right there. And if you go forward a little bit, that's her. This is the girl. Now, I don't know if you can go forward a little bit more because you'll see there's the Eiffel Tower. If you go back to where she is, you'll notice that she is not looking at the Eiffel Tower. She is looking in fear. Can we go back a little bit? You'll notice that I'm also not looking at the Eiffel Tower. I'm keeping one eye on this dude. I haven't done anything yet. You don't need to applaud. You wait, just wait. It gets better. He proceeds to start touching this girl. And I just said, hey, man, can you give us some space? And he asked me if I had a problem. Best answer to that is, do you have a problem? I run the streets. Don't worry, I know how to talk. (laughs) Talking's my only weapon, by the way. (laughs) You get me in a verbal battle, I'm winning every day. I said, do you have a problem? Proceed to say, she's not your problem, she's my problem. I asked her, do you know this man? And shaking, literally tears streaming down her face, she said, I don't know him. It was an awkward situation. I don't want to bore you with the 20 minutes of interactions that went on after that. But we were finally able to get her to safety. And for the next 24 hours, I felt Christ-like. <laughs> At least you saved someone, you know. None happen every day. You know, I mean, we lead people to Jesus. That's safe. But, you know, like physically, for 24 hours, I was telling Kira on the phone. I was calling everyone. Like, I saved someone. And then we're getting on the train, and the crowd was pushing. I lost my cool. Like, for 24 hours, I was Christ-like, and then I lost my patience in a crowd. How many people know what that feels like, where you feel like you're making some ground, only to have a situation that shreds it all apart? This is the Christian life, and we're meant to be Christ-like consistently. Like, surely the, 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 the avoiding a trafficking of a young girl situation counts for credit for longer than 24 hours. But less than 24 hours later, I'm losing my fuse. I'm blowing my fuse at the crowd that are pushing to try and get in front of me and my daughter onto a train. The seat is already on your ticket. You don't have to push. <laughs> Christ-like. Pastor planning a church. <laughs> This is the challenge. This is the challenge. This is, make matters worse. It's not just a challenge. It's an expectation. And Paul, Paul goes even further in Ephesians and he takes what's an expectation and he presents it as an instruction. Check this out. He, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22, Paul describes and directs the church to simply put on their new nature. He says to be Christ-like in Ephesians 4 verse 22, he says, is to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on your new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Isn't that so simple? Thank you, Paul, for that basic instruction, like taking off a garment and putting on a new one. Would you, church, just put on your new nature? It's more difficult than that, Paul. Because even when I decide to put it on, I forget that I've got it on. I forget that I'm even a pastor. What hope do you have, church? (laughs) 
But it's amazing how Paul presents this with such simplicity that you would, now that you're following Christ, put on this new nature to be Christ-like and put off that old nature. You know that old nature with deceit, that old nature with evil desires, that old nature that has your own agenda, that's lazy at times, that's selfish at times, that's forceful at times, that's impatient at times. Anybody, you're looking at me like you don't know this old nature. There's this old nature that anytime we still go to church on Sunday, we walk out with boldness, putting on the new nature. Monday's waiting with your old nature, ready to cloak you again. There's old colleagues are there, that the same old boss is there, that same old traffic on the 101 is still there. That old nature is also always lurking. So Paul, how do we keep the new nature on? How is it possible to walk in this Christ likeness? How do we realistically as believers, knowing what we believe that God has called us, that God chose us before the beginning of time, that we have an inheritance in Him, how do we not just wait to receive the reward in heaven, but how do we live like Christ on earth? I'd love to know. I'd love to know, Paul. Don't be mistaken, Paul is not simplifying what it looks like to be Christ-like. He was simply differentiating between being justified and being sanctified. This is what Paul is doing. He's presenting the parallel or the perspective shift from what it means to be justified and what it means to be sanctified. Can I do a little more teaching today? Regardless of what you say right now, I'm still going to teach. <laughs> I don't know why preachers ask that. Feels like we're doing it together. Let me rephrase. I'm going to do some more teaching today. Because we learn about justified. To be justified speaks of a position. That the moment Christ redeems your life and you come into relationship with him, he puts you in a new position that you are justified with Christ. However, sanctified talks of a process. There are two aspects of being Christ-like. In one sense, you can step into your new redeemed nature because you have been justified. As we learned a couple of weeks ago when Vance preached, the moment that you receive Jesus, you are legally justified being counted as right standing with God. However, God's purpose for us doesn't just stop at being justified. His plan for us is that we would also be glorified, which is a process through sanctification. Romans 8.28 reveals this saying that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The reason this is one of my favorite verses is because it actually shows the lengths that God goes to in utilizing everything in our life to achieve his meticulous plan for our life. That God doesn't ignore situations, he uses situations. They're not details that God says, ah, and you know what, mm, that, yeah, I saw the impatience on the train, we'll, we'll just go back to the saving the girl, let's work with that. No, no, God doesn't waste anything. He, instead of overlooking your past, he uses your past. Oh, stay with me. Instead of overlooking your mistakes, he uses your mistakes. This is good news for anybody that's made mistakes. (laughs) This is good news for anybody. Is there anybody here who has a past? Is there anybody who's made some mistakes? Oh, this is good news. This is for you today. God doesn't overlook our indiscretions. He works through our indiscretions. See, there's pressure when I realize, when I think that I've got to be Christ-like and God's only using the Christ-like elements, but in the not Christ-like elements, God's working. I'll prove it scripturally for you for those that are doubting the word of God and your senior pastor. I'll, I'll, I'll prove it because what you're going to find in scripture is that even the suffering we endure and the opposition we face And the mistakes we make become essential ingredients that get us to our destination, and our destination is glorification. In fact, maybe you would allow me to unpack this idea of glory. Because the notion of glory is consistent through both the Old Testament and even the New Testament as a key theological term that features God's work of judgment, salvation, and blessing. You see, what the Bible does when it talks about glory is it essentially refers to the beauty and the brilliance of God. That's what glory is. It talks about glory of God consistently. You'll find it emphasized and drawn out both in olden scripture and in the new covenant that the glory of God, but it's 
literally trying to sum up what you can't summarize outside of glory, which is talking about the, the, the beauty of God. And not just the beauty of God, but the, just the brilliance of God, the brightness of God. In Hebrew, the word for glory refers to weight, indicating that something has substance to it. So it's not just an image, it's substantial. It has substance. This means that not only can glory be given, but it can also be experienced. So the same way that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen, glory is the substance of God's goodness and the evidence of his invisible image. That was a lot, I know. So in the same way that we talk about, or Hebrews talks about faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So faith is a substance. When you're hoping for something, it feels empty. But what faith does, it makes a substance of it. It makes it something tangible, something you can build off, grab onto, hold onto. That's what faith does. It takes things that are just a wishful thinking or a hopeful thinking and gives it a foundation because it's built on Christ who does not lie and does not fail. Therefore, what is hopeful becomes substantial. It's also at the same time the very evidence I need for what I cannot see. In the same way, glory is that for God. Glory is the substance of God's goodness that I know about and I learn about and that I've experienced at time. It is actually summarized in glory. And because God is invisible, I still experience God in the manifestation of His glory. Are you with me, church? I'm trying to go at a teaching pace, but I really want to preach. I wasn't here last week. I'm ready to preach. And so you've got to understand that this is what the Bible refers to when it's talking about glory, that glory can be given. This is what we see, in fact, in the Godhead, that glory doesn't rest. You always got the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, all giving glory continuously. Jesus is always giving glory to the Father. I don't do anything without the, with the Father telling me uh, I'm going to pray to the Father. The Father always glorifies the Son, and the Holy Spirit is giving glory through the work, and they both glorify the Holy Spirit as the work on the earth. There is glory is always given. And as the saints, we experience the glory of God. In the Old Testament, we find that the glory of God was displayed in the moments of manifest presence. In one section of Scripture, we find that Moses asked God to show him his glory, but to do so, God had to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock so that as his glory passed by, he could see the reflection of God's glory since the full glory of God would have been too much for him to see and survive. We also see the glory of God appear as a cloud in the tent of meeting as Moses would meet with God and, and, and resulting in Moses' face literally shining and emanating the glory of God. It was like he got glory stain on him. He would come out and his face would shine bright like a diamond. He would literally shine like the glory of God would emanate. And, and, and this is why he would put a veil over his face, by the way, so that the people of Israel, they couldn't gaze on the glory of God. So he had to veil his face so that he could... Be around the people. Power of God, the glory of God was manifest. Now in the New Testament, the glory of God is revealed in the Son, Jesus Christ. As we see in John chapter 1, verse 14, I'm just giving you some facts here, some teaching. It says, the word of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In fact, every miracle Jesus performed was a manifestation of glory. What we find between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is what Paul is revealing in 2 Corinthians, this passage we read at the beginning where he contrasts the two covenants in a measurement of glory. He he calls the Old Covenant in one moment a covenant of death. In the next sentence, he calls it the covenant of condemnation. And he reflects it with the New Covenant, which is the covenant of life. And in the contrast, he refers to One is having a former glory, and he refers to the new covenant as as having a surpassing glory. These are the words that he uses in explaining the glory that is connected to the plan of God. Now, stay with me because this is important. You see, Paul illuminates that understanding the glory of God produces an unparalleled boldness in the life of the believer. That when you understand the way God's glory works connected to the new covenant that we are in, it only ever results in a more bold 
and more confident believer. This is going to be so great for anybody who has prayed, God, I'd like more courage. God, I'd like to have more confidence in this life. Anybody who's ever doubted their salvation and you want the assurance of salvation, it's connected to your understanding of glory. So stay with me. I, I, need to, I need to teach this for a moment. I know we want to get ra- rowdy in here. I know we want to shout. And st- I've got to teach it. I've got to teach it. I want to give you some substance. It's the last week in, this, in the series. I need to close it out right so you know what we've been planning all along. That God has glory. That God works His glory in and through your life. He uses situations in your life to produce a Christ-likeness. We are made in His image. He is conforming us to look like Him that we would bear His glory. And there's a process through which God does that. As a result of understanding God's glory, you'll be more bold. What Paul does is he uses Moses as an example. He says in verse 12, since we have such a hope, we're very bold. Not like Moses, by the way. And this is controversial stuff because he's, he's speaking about Jews and Gentiles. And the Jewish folk, they definitely esteemed Moses. It was almost like Yahweh and Moses, very similar standing. So here he is, he's, he's contradicting the notion of what they had believed about Moses. That the reason Moses veiled his face is because the glory was so powerful that people couldn't gaze upon it. What Paul does is he says this, since we have such a hope, we're very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze on the outcome of what was being brought to an end. That's what they believed. You see, the Israelites were were led to believe that that's why Moses covered his face, because it's too bright. Can't look at him. We need to put some shades on, man. Like, cover that thing up. It's too bright. But Paul reveals that Moses actually veiled his face to hide the fact that the glory was already fading. That from the moment he departed from the presence of God, he looked like God, but it was wearing out. Kind of like our Christ nature. Like when I'm on Sunday morning, I'm looking like Christ, but come Monday, man, I don't resemble that so much anymore. It's that old covenant idea of glory. That's what Paul is revealing. This is why Moses covered his face, because it was a decreasing glory. It was momentary. However, under the new covenant, what we have is called an ever-increasing glory because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is the key factor. And you've got to understand what that means, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I love what it says in verse 18, and we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes... From the Lord who is the Spirit. So check this out. While you might feel like you're not making much ground in the pursuit of Christ likeness, because of the Holy Spirit, even our weaknesses don't diminish his glory. Instead, our weaknesses become a brilliant backdrop to the glory of God. This is because the Holy Spirit is the active agent in the new covenant in our lives. The Holy Spirit is the active agent. Can I talk about the Holy Spirit for a minute? I just like the yes. We see if we were to continue with the contrasts under the old covenant, like God's glory, the Holy Spirit was revealed in momentary manifestations or specific deposits. You would see that it was connected to an assignment where the Holy Spirit would be deposited upon different judges, different kings, different prophets, different people of God. And it was a transferred anointing. We saw it from Elijah to Elisha that the Holy Spirit would come upon a leader or a particular person who was strategic in the plan and purpose of God and the Holy Spirit would rest upon them and then the Holy Spirit would depart from them. It was a deposit and a depart. But what Jesus said is under the new covenant, one of the key ingredients of the new covenant that contrasts with the old covenant is that the Holy Spirit would not be portioned out but would be poured out without measure. He says this to the disciples when he's talking to the disciples here and talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, referring to disciples in John uh, 14 and verse 16, he refers to the distinct function change of the Holy Spirit, saying this, check this out, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. 
You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. It's this in you factor that is the key component to the way God's glory outworks in our life. I need you to stay with me just for a little bit more. It's the in you factor that is the distinct change from old covenant glory to new covenant glory. In the old covenant glory, there was, there was no Christ in you factor. It was God with us. As the Israelites would walk, they would talk about God is with us. It was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. There was a cloud of glory in the tent of meeting that would surround the tabernacle and they would say, God is with us. God is with us doesn't work in a new covenant setting because it's God in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And it's this in us factor because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that manifests the glory of God, making us better by His glory. You see, what Paul wanted to illuminate to the church, to the Ephesians, is that it doesn't matter what situations you're going through. Because of the Holy Spirit, He is producing actively the fruits of the Spirit. That's why it's called produce. (laughs) He's producing. He's using the situations to bear fruit, to, to produce some things. He uses pressure to produce patience. He's actively working in every situation. He uses hardship to produce joy. He uses uncertainty to produce peace. He uses our own selfish desires to produce self-control. He takes the backdrop of our life and our mistakes and He uses them as the rock bed of developing fruit in our lives because He hasn't departed from us. He's in it with us. He's building a conviction. The very fact that I'm frustrated that I lost my cool while getting onto the train is the reminder that God's working in me. Because the Holy Spirit in me reminded me, I called you more than that. Ah, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm growing. I'm not the best Christian. I'm not the best believer. I don't know if this feels freeing to... Share that to somebody. Maybe you need to share that. You're not the best believer. But I am getting better by the glory of God. I might not be the best when it comes to faith. I might not be the best when it comes to knowing Scripture. I might not be the best when it comes to looking like Christ. But I can tell you I'm getting better by the glory of God. And because of the Holy Spirit that's in my life, He's actively outworking the fruits of the Spirit. So whether I think I'm progressing or not, I am being changed into the glory of God by the activity of the Holy Spirit despite the inactivity of me. In other words, the glory of God is mediated by the Holy Spirit at work within us, leading us from our position of being justified through a process of being sanctified to the result of being glorified. So while I might not yet be the best believer, I'm certainly getting back. This has to be encouraging. This has to be encouraging. That through the work of the Holy Spirit, you're getting better. Actually, let me put it a better way. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, you're getting bolder. See, that's what Paul says is the result. That that I'm getting... The whole reason Paul was presenting this idea of glory to the Corinthians is because he was trying to produce an unparalleled boldness in them. He's like, you don't have a departed glory. Sunday isn't to fill the tank up and let it out, leak out and empty, so then you come stumbling back into Sunday. Pastor, pray for me. Man, you heard the, prayer. the devil's been on me all week, man. There's been pressure. I lost my cool. I went back to smoking. I went back to cussing. I went back to my old... No, 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 that's not, that's, that's not the life of the believer. Sunday's powerful because I get connected with the body of Christ and I get reminded of my purpose, but in a, it's not here where the Holy Spirit's outworking. It's out there where the Holy Spirit's outworking. He's outworking His fruit in my life as I face obstacles. <laughs> this is the concept of peace. Peace isn't away from situations. God's peace is present in situations. 
God doesn't remove you from the world so that you'll be peaceful. He brings His peace and His presence into your world so that even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. My God is with me. My God is for me. I don't need to be on the mountaintop in a Zen state to have peace. I can be in the midst of the terrifying valley. I can be in the midst of a trafficker. I can be in the midst of situations and have the peace of God as my weapon. It's again the backdrop of our life that God's glory is manifest. It's an ever-increasing glory. Not only making us better, it's making us bolder. Verse 12, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. That's what this entire series has been about, by the way. We better understand the sovereignty of God and how He's working in every situation. We can, we can walk out as bold believers, confident in Christ, understanding that God is able to work all things together for good for those who, are, who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. That we have this confidence that the Holy Spirit is the active agent working His glory, not from the outside in trying to make us just resemble God, not just that we would reflect God, but that we would emanate God, that we would find God working from the inside out, not the outside in. So that even though there are some things that I need to catch up on, may, I don't know how long you've been walking with God. Maybe you're still working on the language thing. Maybe you're still trying to align your desires with God. Maybe you're still trying to work on some stuff. Well, here's some good news for you. God's working with you. It's not just get better and then come to me. God's like, let's do this together. Let me work on the inside. Let me work it out of you. Let me start to change the heart the motives, the desires, not just the behaviors. You begin to look like Christ. You don't have to put the Christian veil on. Act all Christian. You know the people who spook me out the most is the super spiritual Christians. When you meet them, especially when you're planting churches, talk to some people and like, oh, brother, God bless you. Brother, the Lord sent me here today. Oh, did he? Okay. I asked one guy literally this last week, oh, how'd you come to be here? He said, the Lord brought me. I said, I came on a plane. It was amazing how God does. They freaked me out. Because it's a veil. It's a veil projecting one thing, but the reality of it is it's false. We don't have to come with veiled faces. We come with an honesty to say, I'm not the best, but I'm getting better. I know you're looking at my life and you're thinking it's not that Christ-like, but it's more Christ than it was. And I might not be the best, but it doesn't disqualify me from being better. And it doesn't disqualify me from sharing the glory of God. It doesn't disqualify me from telling you what God done in my life because... If you think this is bad, you should have seen me before. Watch what God's doing as the glory of God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit begins to birth out of my life. And you begin to see my patterns change and my habits change and my customs change and my language change. My belief is changing. I used to be riddled with fear, but now I believe with optimism that God has a bright new day. I used to be chained to addiction, but thank God I'm set free from that and I have the freedom to choose what I want to do. His glory.